Um, well, like uh, Dean uh, highlighted, a lot of science is about story. And so what I want to do is take the next seven minutes, right, Dean, seven minutes, and tell you uh, my story and how I ended up here and working with the uh, elephants. So this is Rhode Island. This is where I was born and spent the uh, formidable years. When I was 15, I was actually diagnosed with childhood cancer myself. And I actually went at that time from, uh, that was my summer, I was 15, that was my summer of R&R, &R, rest and radiation. And I went north uh, to Harvard and I spent some time there. And after that experience, I said, okay, I'm done with medicine. I never want to step foot in a hospital ever again uh, for the rest of my life. Well, stranger things have happened. I ended up at, at Brown and I ended up um, at the medical school. Uh, at that point, uh, I got married and uh, had to figure out where I'd go for residency. My wife also is from Rhode Island. And we said, let's see where we can go at the farthest possible spot in the continental US so we can avoid the pop-in for our parents. <laughs> and so we ended up uh, at Stanford, where I did my residency uh, and chief residency and fellowship in pediatric oncology. I wanted to become a pediatric oncologist and take care of patients the way the doctors had taken care of me. Now, I had never set foot in a lab at that point in time. Had nothing to, I didn't want to have anything to do with the lab. And at that point, though, I met this girl. And it's always the patients that guide us in our careers, especially in medicine. This is Danielle. She was four when I met her. She had childhood leukemia. Not so unusual, except that two years earlier, she had a brain tumor, and her father's brother had died of a brain tumor, as well as her father. So she ended up having Lee Fraumeni syndrome, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Ended up working in a laboratory, went kicking and screaming, by the way, into the laboratory, but fell in love with it. It was fantastic. And did an extra year in the lab, wrote papers, got grants, at which point my wife said, you know what, Josh, it's time to get a real job. Right? I've supported you for however many decades. So that's where we started looking, and that's how I ended up here. Right? Working in pediatrics, working at Huntsman, working at Primary Children's. And really, as you're going to hear, this is the place to do the type of research we ended up doing. So as that is my background, we started taking care of patients here with Lee Fraumeni syndrome and studying them. Now, patients with Lee Fraumeni syndrome have a genetic risk for cancer due to a mutation in one of their p53 genes. We all have two copies of p53, one from our mother and one from our father. These patients, unfortunately, only have one working copy. P53 is known as the guardian of the genome. It has two very important jobs. It stops the cell from dividing so you can fix it. And if it doesn't fix it, it helps to coordinate apoptosis or cell death or cell suicide. When I'm explaining it to the families, I say, I think of P53 as the superhero of our genome, right? It's a gene in its underpants with a cape on, flying around trying to fix any type of DNA damage that it can find. Now, unfortunately, if you don't have this gene, 100% lifetime risk of cancer. As Dean mentioned, we're very interested in our laboratory in studying comparative oncology. What types of animals get cancer? What can we learn from evolution and nature? We had been very focused on people and animals. This is our dog, Rhodey, named for Rhode Island. Now you know the story. Uh, and he unfortunately died a couple of years after we moved to Utah due to a bone tumor. And it turns out that dogs develop cancer at 11 times the rate of, of people. Who here has a dog? Who has a dog that they know has died of cancer, right? Many hands are still up in the air, all right? So this is, was our focus. And now I ended up uh, at a meeting about the evolution of cancer because of my interest in who gets cancer and why, where I met Carlo Maley and Aaliyah Collin. And they started talking about Pedo's paradox. This is the phenomenon that elephants and large mammals, take elephants, for example, 100 times the size of people, so many cells dividing over and over and over again, living 50, 60, sometimes seven year, 70 years, right? That many decades, that many cells dividing. Just by chance alone, all elephants should be developing cancer. In fact, they should be developing cancer before the age of 10, before they are even fertile, right? But then all elephants would be dropping dead and they go extinct, and extinction's not a good strategy for survival, right? So Carlo was explaining this and he said, well, you know, we looked at the genome of these elephants to try to understand this paradox. Why don't they get more cancer? Why do they have actually less cancer than people? And he said, we found in their genome that instead of two copies of P53, 
Like in people, elephants have, ready, wait for it, 40. 40 copies of P53, 20 times as much. So he said, we think this may be, we're not sure, perhaps the reason why elephants don't get cancer, but we don't know. So I went up to Carlo afterwards and I said, Carlo, what would you say if I told you back in my lab at the University of Utah, we are studying and taking care of patients who are missing P53 and have 100% risk of cancer. You just told us elephants have 20 times as much P53 and never get cancer. What if we could get some elephant blood and run it in our assays, our DNA repair test, right next to the Lee Frameni patients? What would you say? Of course, he said the magic words in academics. He said, Josh, if you can do that, I'd say you're on the paper. Right? So I said, okay, Carlo, you had me a co-author. Let's do it. He said, how are you going to get elephant blood? I said, I have no idea. Right? Now this is where the magic of Utah comes in. It was a weekend a few uh, weekends later, and my wife said, why don't you spend some time with the kids? Why don't you take them to the zoo? I said, okay. We ended up at the Hogel Zoo, where we caught the uh, elephant show, and they explained that once a week at the zoo, they actually draw blood from their elephants to make sure that they're healthy and everything is good. So I ended up talking to the elephant keeper and we worked out an arrangement. We submitted our IRB to the zoo, right? Who knew the zoo had an IRB? And once a week, we draw, they were drawing blood from these elephants and uh, we brought it to the lab and I'll tell you in the last few minutes what we actually found. In addition to the zoo, we were fortunate enough to work with Ringling Brothers and Barnum Bailey Circus who also have a tremendous amount of elephants. Now, all of this led, as you heard, to some fantastic uh, publicity. Uh, we were able to actually get our story published as a peer-read journal, uh, Newsweek, but more importantly, in a peer-reviewed journal in JAMA. And this really has made a tremendous splash, both in the scientific world, but also in, in the lay press. And just very briefly, you can go to the paper for details, but what we found were that these elephant cells actually don't repair their DNA any faster when we expose them to radiation or chemotherapy, but actually undergo apoptosis at a much faster rate. And we have lots of data to back it up, and in fact, they're apoptosing much higher, five times as high as the patients with Lee Frameni syndrome. So we think these elephant P53s are what protects these elephants from developing cancer. And on the last slide, what I'll show you is that this is a picture of Haifa, Israel, where I had an opportunity to present this data. And I didn't realize it, but in the audience was a genius from Technion Institute. I, I'm convinced he's going to win the Nobel Prize. And he works on nanoparticles and drug delivery. And we started talking afterwards about what we're doing in Utah with the elephants and P53 and DNA repair. And he was telling us about what he's doing with chemotherapy and nanoparticles. And we said, we need to get together and set up a collaboration, which is exactly what we're doing now, to figure out how to get this elephant P53 into nanoparticles as a new class of therapeutic drugs to help deliver to patients and families who already have cancer, and maybe even one day for those who are at risk for cancer. So that is my story, how I ended up from Providence, Rhode Island, all the way to Utah, playing with these wonderful elephants at our Hogel Zoo. And again, this was really only possible because of the environment we have here at the University of Utah with all of the wonderful collaborations and partners that we have. So thank you so much for your time and your attention. Any quick questions? because of uh, the fact you're, you're proposing to use elephant P53, that it's not just the 40 copies, but there's something different about the elephant? Yes, exactly. So those extra, oh yeah, so the question was, is there something different about those 40 copies? What, what is it about the elephant copies? And it turns out that these are retrogenes or pseudo-retrogenes. They're missing introns, and they're a little bit shorter than what we're calling the ancestral P53. And so what we're doing now in the lab is we're going through each of those copies of P53, and I should really shout out to the lab members, right? They're the ones who are doing the hard work. Um, and they're, we're actually trying to characterize each P53 to understand, is it functional? What's the mechanism? Is it acting as a decoy? So that's exactly what we're trying to understand. But they are slightly different than the human P53s. Thank you so much, Josh. Okay, thank you.